Good evening, at this time I'm gonna call to order this workshop for June 12, 2023. City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Commissioner Vila Vasquez. Present. Commissioner Burbank. Absent. Commissioner Colwell. Here. Commissioner Jody Lee. Here. Commissioner McCool. Here. Vice Mayor Bradford. Absent. And Mayor Vila. Thank you, can you please stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. This time we're gonna enter into business. Section 4A, presentation by Kelly Marks with K-Marks Events who put on the Bacon and Brew Festival at Duio Boster Sports Complex. If you push, push the button. button. Okay. okay. Hello, my name is Becky Hughes. I've been with Kelly Marks for the last four years for Bacon and Brew Fest. Um, she could not make it. She was out of town and could not make it back in time for this evening. Um, but her and I have prepared a statement in regards to the Bacon and Brew Festival that happened here in Deltona. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. So first I'd like to report that this was a redo from the original date of November 12th when the hurricane came in. The new city manager called it a week ahead and Miss Marks pleaded for him to wait and see what happens after the storm because the storm was supposed to pass by the Friday before. The request was to wait the day before to call it. He did not. The weather was perfect and K Marks received a lot of complaints and people wanting refunds. I personally drove out to the park and it was in beautiful condition that day. On April 17th, between 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m., Sharon Shivers, Assistant Chief Fire Marshal, sent an email to all food vendors asking to fill out the mobile and temporary cooking operations form with a deadline of April 19th. Note, this was two days before and at the end of the business day. Some were not available and were traveling and did not have internet access, etc. Before that date, Ms. Marks and her vendors tried to reach her by phone, but she did not respond. Ms. Marks put a call into your city manager to let him know about the chaos that was going on with Ms. Shivers and that she was losing food vendors because of the way that this was being handled. He was very rude to Ms. Marks and told her that maybe she doesn't know how to put on events correctly. Ms. Marks was not appreciative of this comment. She's a professional events promoter and city councilwoman for city, Orange City and did not deserve these comments. On April 19th, Ms. Shivers sent out another email regarding Saturday inspection, which at that time, we were starting to lose food vendors that could not comply in the two-day period. This email said Fire Inspector Lisa Naudu and Captain Sam Schiller would be on site at 9 a.m. to assist with the placement of our food vendors since there's a good amount of them. In 10 years of events in Deland, Ormond Beach, Port Orange, and more, fire, no fire inspector has done this. We are an experienced events company who does not let the fire inspector select placement of our vendors. The day before, Assistant Chief Shivers is worried about the exit signs being lit during the daytime when you can't clearly see if they are lit or not in the VIP tent. Clearly, she was picking a problem, probing, while Miss Marks is at the City Hall picking up the event permit the day of. 7 a.m. loading non-food vendors on the back gate. Going smooth thanks to the help of your Parks and Rec crew who were awesome and very helpful. 9 a.m. Food trucks are staged out front to enter at 9 a.m. after the non-food vendors were set in the back gate to enter. Inspector Lisa decides to go tell all our food trucks to go to the back gate instead. We are running a few minutes late on, on getting non-food vendors in because Parks and Rec had to load all their stuff and drive into their spot. No vehicles on the green is a policy that we have not encountered at any other facility or municipality. Two years ago, we had a tractor trailer with a stage that was on your green for over a week and left minimal damage. Keep in mind that this is your largest event. You cannot compare this to Latin Fest since that, since that seemed to be the remark of everybody on the day of. Also, the confusion with the inspector placing our vendors caused the festival to open an hour late, which denied our VIP pass holders from enjoying early access that they paid for. 
This has, festival is a highly advertised and attracts people from all over the US and other countries. For example, this year we saw guests from Canada and England. This helps put Deltona on the map. This also creates community engagement with your residents, which was the ultimate goal. Mayor Vila and other commissioners seem to enjoy this festival with their families as well. This event was moved from DeLand because Deltona wanted to have a family-friendly festival open to people of all cultures. This event has proved to be successful in the two years that it's been hosted in Deltona. And we like to think that that goal has been achieved. If these issues persist with the disrespect from your city manager, miscommunication from your assistant chief Shivers, and your fire inspector giving vendors direction without the promoter's consent, we'll be forced to consider an alternative location for the Bacon and Brew Festival. Please take a look at your assistant fire chief Shivers, who has a reputation now with other promoters to not want to come back to Deltona because of her. You may lose out on some quality events. We also would like to note that due to relocation of our offices and other consecutive KMARX events, we have not been able to close out the financials from this year's Bacon and Brew Fest. But we do believe attendance was a little lower due to the reschedule and other conflicts and hope to present a check to the benefiting nonprofit organization the next few weeks. We will invite the commission for the check presentation and photo op. Lastly, we would like to take the time to express our thanks and appreciation to your Parks and Rec Director and his staff for the assistance in this, in this festival. They were amazing, and we could not have pulled this off without them. We are open to working to resolve these issues with the City of Deltona in the future. Please feel free to contact us with any questions or concerns. We want to thank all of you for your time. Sincerely, Kelly Marks and Becky Hughes. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? Commissioner Vila Vasquez? I have, I don't have questions. I have some uh, comments and questions for our city. So um, there were other events that had taken place um, at Dewey Boston. Uh, one was the Latin Festival that you mentioned. The other one was the uh, Puerto Rican Cultural Festival that took place. That was the last one that took place. And I want everybody to know that la that last festival, they paid 100% of their expenses. Nothing was donated or sponsored or anything by anyone here in the city. Um, and I just want to bring up some um, comments that were made to me and they called me. Um, and of course, I passed them on to uh, our city manager, Mr. Chisholm. So my question is, is there a list of items that need to be inspected um, before a certain number of days of the day of the festival to open? Not two days before the festival or not three days before the festival. Is there um, something that can be put in place to give the person who is the event coordinator enough time to fix whatever is wrong, um, because two days is not gonna cut it. Let's also remember that these vendors are the ones who pay for the festival. Um, and the more vendors we turn away for whatever reason, um, it's less income that comes into the event. That's number one. The other um, question I wanna ask is, Instead of contacting vendors, can it be made more uh, easier to contact the event coordinator with any problems that is found uh, when inspection is done um, in a more, uh, you know, a more um, acceptable, acceptable time to have the problem corrected? And um, I know these questions will be answered, but the other thing is, so to us, a festival is a traditional event. And there's a lot of things that used to happen in a festival that no longer can happen. For example, um, if you go to any other festival, Sanford, Orlando, and I know I can't compare Deltona to these other cities, but I just wanna explain how these festivals are done because it's a tradition. It's a celebration of different traditions and different cultures. 
One of the things that is done is they have a cooking area. There's no tents, just a cooking area that's set up. You know, they have their, their um, cooking equipment, uh, their stoves with the, um, whatever that it's needed to turn on the stoves, and it's open. They fry, they cook, they do everything underneath there. That's, that's a festival for um, a lot of traditions. It's not under a tent. And, I, and here in Deltona, it used to be done. They used to have festivals like that. You don't see that anymore. And that is one of the cooking uh, vendors that bring in the most money to these festivals. Not only to the event coordinator, but they sell the most because what they're offering is tied into that festival that's being done. So that's not being accepted anymore. And I wanna know why. As long as everything is checked, everything is in order, um, they have everything that's required that's, re that's also being done under a tent, uh, which is more dangerous to me because you're under a tent. This particular uh, place that they're referring to, it's in the open, out in the open. Again, it was accepted at one time. I used to do events, and those were uh, one of the areas that uh, was there before. And again, um, we have to give event coordinators enough time to correct whatever errors uh, they find with the vendors. These event coordinators are not trying to tell the city how to do their job by all means, but if they're allowed to do something with an acceptable reason and, and it passes all the policies and procedures in one area, what is the difference in Deltona uh, to stop them from having this um, events here? And every time I turn around, they're telling me, we've lost so many vendors. Um, they don't want to come to Deltona anymore. Um, so I just want to find out what is the problem again. They made it very clear, we're not trying to tell Deltona to change their rules and policies. We're not telling them, the inspector, how to do her job. It's just that there's too much differences compared to other areas. And we're talking about this last vendor who does events all over Florida. Um, and again, these vendors are the ones who bring in the money. So if we can work, around these things that they have brought to my attention and see if we can work around them or what is it that Deltona can do to bring these people back? Mr. Mayor, in response, uh, I believe um, those that have uh, the vendors who have a piece of equipment they use for vending, I believe they can get inspected any time throughout the year. And don't they have a sticker that's placed on those? Yeah, Ms. Shivers, I don't mean to interrupt you. You can please come up to the mic. Yes, through the Fire Chiefs Association group, they did finally approve our policy that is countywide, um, where now all municipalities have um, access to the sticker. So you'll have the sticker placed on the front of your food vendor or your food truck, so that you know that eyes have been placed on it somewhere, some at some point in time in Volusia County. Um, it doesn't eliminate you from still being able to go in and doing spot checks, um, but at least you know that they have been looked at somewhere in Volusia County within the last six months. Okay, so what I'm referring to is not a food truck. Yes. It's, um, they rent the spot and they set up tables and they set up sections. You know, they cook here, they cook fry here, they serve here. Okay. It's not a tent. No. It's out in the open. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Sanford anywhere, you're gonna find that. Um, the last one I went was, was in uh, um, Tampa. You'll find that because they leave it in the open because they do a lot of frying. Yes. So the smoke and everything is out, you know, out uh, free to, to um, go out in the air. So that's not a food truck. Um, only recently do you find so many food trucks in a fair or in a, a festival. It's just recently, because before, there were hardly any food trucks. People cooked under the tent, which to me is more dangerous. 
Um, but this particular um, food vendors that you will find anywhere you go, they set up uh, tables and it's open. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's not allowed in these two last festivals. So there is a section in the code, which I will I will provide to you, where um, it allows the authority having jurisdiction to um, require fixed suppression under any um, portable frying, which is, is pretty much unrealistic. So we just, because of the dangers associated with deep fat fryers and, and whatnot, turkey fryers, they pose a high hazard, so we just across the board made that uh, made that decision not to allow them. Um, when you talk about cooking under tents or not under tents, it's kind of a double-edged sword because the health department, DBPR, they can come out at any time and shut you down because you're not cooking underneath the tent. We don't regulate that. We don't know when they're going to show up. So if you are cooking underneath of a tent, we ask that it be flame retardant just to kind of bring the hazard down a little bit if that answers your question. But as far as the code reference, I can provide that to you where it talks about um, deep fat fryers, turkey fryers. Okay, like so those. there is no deep fryers or turkey fryers. We're talking about regular cooking pots. Oh, so no. what you're saying is, who made a decision not to allow this? The fire department. Our fire department. For, for frying outside of a fixed suppression system. I don't, know, I don't know what you're referring to when you talk about just a crock pot, a hot dog no, it's warmer. regular. It's like if you're frying. It's like if you're cooking in your kitchen, mm -hmm. but it's outdoors with the regular pots, frying pans, rice pans, all that different, you know, um, items that are. I'm only ex bringing this up because that is part of a fair. Only Deltona does not allow that. Um, so I just want to know why. You know, uh, is, it, is it something that it's a policy? Is it something that we Deltona came up with? I just want to know why, because when they ask me, I have no, no answer for them. Yeah, if, if you give me um, some examples of who it is that you're referring to, I'll look at what type of cooking. It was not allowed at the Latin festival, and it was not allowed at the last um, Puerto Rican um, cultural festival that was done. Okay, yeah, if you provide me with the vendor information of those that we, we said would not be able to, then I can give you better information. Then. Okay, yeah, the other question references. I have, and I'm sorry guys, it's just that all these questions were brought to me. What is the allow distance between each vendor um, that it's not, has, is not selling any food or anything? What is the distance between each tent? That we don't, we don't regulate. We suggest a walking clearance, you know, maybe three to five feet at max. Okay, um, I was but told. But if it's not cooking, then we, we don't yeah. typically regulate that. Okay, I was told they would, they would um, require five feet from each tent, and no. every five feet, that's a it vendor a that, you, that they lose. That was, a, that was the last event, and it was a suggestion simply because they had so many that they were kind of boxing them in. They were leaving some space here and there for for egress. It was just a suggestion. It was okay. not a requirement. Maybe they, mis they misunderstood because Correct. to them, every five feet, it's is a, a vendor. less, less vendor that, that yes. they can have. All right, I, I just wanted to make sure that I had answers when they're asking me these questions because I'm not the inspector. You know, I, I can't tell them, yeah, that's, try, or, or that's right or that's wrong. Mm -hmm. But I did promise them that I would follow up on it, which is what I'm doing. Yeah, and if you don't mind, um, we have a standardized checklist that's part of that policy that I talked about where um, all of the municipalities in Volusia County will be using so that we can try and remain consistent. Um, everything on that checklist has a code backing. Unfortunately, I can't speak for other inspectors and jurisdictions on how they enforce or not enforce, um, but I can provide you that three-page document, and it gives you a list of everything that we would be looking at, as well as everyone in Volusia County should be looking at, um, with the code backing, so that it gives you an idea of what we'll be looking at when we go out and do these inspections. Okay. How many days before the opening of the festival are you notifying these of? Uh, uh, um, event coordinators of the that they don't qualify or, or these these number of vendors or how many days do you do the inspection or look or request um, license because I know for food trucks the that's on the owner that on the um, owner of the property's responsibility mm -hmm. like you said the city drives around if they have the sticker 
it's that's good for us. But I've heard that um, some of the vendors have to show their license, their inspections, their forms, I mean, everything under the umbrella uh, to the inspector. Um, when this is the responsibility of the event coordinator. Yes, that is something that, that we, and, and when I say we, the inspectors have backed off on because we, we're we not here to regulate your DBPR. We're not here to regulate your business tax receipt. We're not here to make sure you have insurance. That's. That's really parks and rec and risk management. Um, so that, that has since stopped. Um, what we do regulate is we have them fill out a form, just an application, so that we know who's gonna be at these events ahead mm -hmm. of time. The last thing we wanna do is get to an event to do the inspection, have 10 vendors, and six of them, we have no idea who they are. So we try and be proactive and filter out and work with the vendor to make sure that, yes, you've got your fixed suppression, yes, you've got your extinguishers up to date, yes, you've had your hood cleaning, so that we can get to that event and really just do our spot checks, you're 10 feet apart, your, your generators are good, and walk away. We don't wanna get there and do our inspection to a vendor that we've never dealt with before. So to answer your question as far as how long in advance I give them, with Kelly's, with Kelly's, it was a unique situation. We had the hurricane, so we started out good, and then there was that lag, and then we go and, and had to reschedule the event. Her initial application came in in February of 2022, and the event was in November of 2022, which thank you for getting it in early. I do appreciate that, because it does allow us time. Um, but I wasn't getting any vendor applications. So we give them the application and I do work, I give it directly to Parks and Rec who then sends it to the events coordinator. I give them the, uh, the um, list of, of general approval comments and the application to give to their food vendors. The food vendors will fill it out. Originally, they were sending it to Parks and Rec Department so that Parks and Rec could verify that they have their DBPR, their, their um, licenses, whatever. That since changed, so now they just come directly to the fire department, and we focus on, do you have your fixed suppression up to date? Do you have a fixed suppression system? Do you have your hood cleaning? And we go down the list of criteria so that we can make sure the day of the event, we're not gonna have any issues with them. Okay, um, I would like to make a request, if I'm allowed, is to uh, any future festivals, if you find that a vendor is missing something and you email them, that you copy the event coordinator. I do. Because a lot of, what I understand, a lot of the emails that you were sending was going to spam um, at the vendor's end. And then they were contacting their event coordinator and the event coordinator did not have a copy of that email. Um, and she, you know, only after speaking to you, they would find out and she, you know, they would tell, go to the spam and that's where the email was and they would forward it to the uh, event coordinator. So if you copy the vendor, but also the event coordinator, it will help um, maybe the event coordinator to act on it before the vendor itself with you and to resolve the problems in less, you know, uh, time and, um, enough time to fix it before the event gets in. Yeah, you know? and, I, and I do, we try and get, and it, it's an evolving thing. You know, we, we don't want to turn vendors away. We, we accept applications up to the very last minute. We try and put a deadline on it two weeks prior so that we can go and start working with these vendors two weeks out. Mm -hmm. It takes time. There's a lot of these vendors. We have a list of over 100 food vendors that we've dealt with, but there's still food vendors out there that we haven't dealt with. And when you bring in these events, for example, the one that we, we just had, there was a lot of them that we hadn't dealt with. I worked one on one and did copy the event coordinator, but yes, we'll take your suggestion and, right. and make it happen for yeah, sure. And maybe, you know, when somebody comes to um, sign up for an event, just let them know. Uh, please let your vendors know if they're not registered with the city of Deltona. They can send us all the information as soon as possible. Get that out of the way. I try. You know, so that it will be um, less of a hassle on you mm -hmm. and especially on the event coordinator. Some have called me in tears, so. But thank you for the work that you do. Mr. Mayor, no, I just um, want to clear up a couple of things because I want to be sure we understand. Uh, there was a comment about, the, about having a cooking area outside in the open with no tent or anything. Yes. And your comment was, well, you wanted to see their suppression system? 
they, I doubt they can have a suppression no, system. Exactly. It's unrealistic to have it. When you have okay. deep fat fryers you, under a tent, you're not going to have a fixed suppression. There are devices, that, there are equipment out there that are self-contained, but realistically, the cost associated with it is not. All right, so. This is not is under the, the tent. Well, hang on just a minute. I want to make sure, it doesn't matter if it's a tent or not, because I, I want to make sure that the inspection of those properties, are you, are you saying they can have their event, they can use it, they can go to the event either under a tent or an open area with cookers and fryers? Currently, the way that it is now, based on the code, it allows the authority having jurisdiction to not allow for any type of frying outside of a cooking suppression system. So that's so up to us. That is up to us, correct. And right now, you're not allowing it? Correct. Outside of a food truck that has fixed suppression. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Can you explain to me when you say cook, cooking suppression, what does that mean? A sprinkler system for your cooking equipment. But they do have their fire extinguishers underneath. Mm -hmm. yes. Isn't that the same? That's a secondary backup. The fixed suppression is the primary. But that's correct. So is that a new policy that was put into place? Because I did events here, we cooked that way and nobody said anything as long as we had our, our fire extinguishers. I know in the past, and I, I can't go back, I'll have to go back and ask you know, Lee Grovner and, and Lisa Nidu, but I know prior to my coming here in 2020, they were not allowing it. Okay. How far back that went, I don't know. Yeah, my, my point is just to be sure we know what's, what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Thank you. Commissioner Jody Lee, and then we're gonna to go to Commissioner McCool. Hell, I forgot. Do you I still said, need me? Assistant Chief, Chief <laughs> Dick for coming up, because I was gonna ask you to come up a minute ago, because you know, I heard that you were being uh, purposely hard on the fire, if I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but I've, I've discussed with you several times. I, I don't know if you wanna address any of the things that were said about you, if not, because I don't think you are just personally be trying to be difficult for no reason whatsoever. I've had many conversations with you and I don't, you don't come across that way. Uh, the food truck, of course we all know we've, I've had food trucks many times and got a lot of issues with food trucks. Your tents, that people cook food. Is there a distance like the food trucks that has to be 10 feet away, 10 feet above the whole night, just like the food trucks? Or is there separate rules for a tent that does food compared to a food truck? Uh, I don't have that answer. I, I know generators need to be five feet away from buildings, structures, tents. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if there's a distance requirement between tent and tent when you have cooking. Um, when you have the food trucks, there's that 10 foot bubble. Okay, if, the, if you're, but if you're, that's the, my, my thing about it. If you're cooking in the tent or a truck, guess what? You're still cooking. Yes. It doesn't matter. So the 10 feet for the tr truck, but not for a tent makes no sense whatsoever. There's a lot in the code that doesn't make sense, unfortunately, that we don't always agree with, but we have to still enforce. And so, if you don't mind, Sam, do you know of a requirement? Is it for tents the same? Okay, so 10 so feet around for that. tents as well as trucks. So that maybe at least makes sense. It's uniform for both of them. Yeah, and I, you're right. I can't see a, I can't see a tent having an ansel system in, her, in the tent. I just, I think it's unrealistic. But I, I do think it should go back and look at if we made a decision, people can't fry outside. If that's our decision as a city, uh, there's a lot of festivals that have fried foods. I mean, you can't, that means you go to a festival and they have a tent, you can't get fried dough because there's an outside fryer. Who goes to a fair and doesn't get fried dough? So I think we need to look at some smaller th things like this to take care of. Thank you for coming up and giving yours. I think there's a lot more stuff in the city worried about than, than sorry, food trucks and food tents and festivals and fairs. But <laughs> and if I may, the inspection that occurred at the tent for bacon and brew, that was not, I did not do that inspection. So I just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you just came up here and talked about it and gave your insight on it and I'm fine. Thank you, Commissioner Dinamakul. 
Thank you very much. I think that the, um, I, what I see here are a couple of issues. I would like to call them that are solvable. Miscommunication being one thing. First of all, there's a great disappointment and I know that I got received a letter from uh, Kelly because she puts a lot into this regarding having the festival to begin with. As far as the hurricane goes, I'm sure it was disappointing for everyone. It's a revenue buster. I understand that. I'm a business person, so I understand that that was very handicapping also to have to move it to another day, but I don't think that there's any way that the city could have made another move because we didn't know what the outcome was, and that's unfortunate. With that being said, with me, uh, I, I would try to redouble my efforts if something like this happened again to work with the vendor um, given the level of disappointment from not being able to have it to begin with, but I stand behind our city manager for making that decision because we just never knew what this was going to be like, and I think that we did the best um, that we could given that. However, I also am big on getting our vendors to yes getting them where they can participate, getting them where we know that we need staff to help people with last minute things, because these are teachable moments in a city when we're trying to get business in, and I think that we need to be really, really accommodating um, as far as that goes, so as not to send the messages that we're not trying to nurture or incubate business here, where, wherever that miscommunication comes in, you know. Uh, so, I, and I want to clarify something also. As far as the, um, I heard that the um, pre-checks used to go to Parks and Rec and now they go to the fire department. Is that, is, what did I hear regarding that? So prior to Marlene leaving, mm -hmm. the way the process worked was we would, they, we would create the food vendor application again, yep. send it to the, the applicant, they distribute it to their food vendors, they send it in. Originally, they were sending it into the Parks and Rec Department, who was pre-qualifying them, if you mm -hmm. will, making sure that they had everything that Parks and Rec needs, mm -hmm. if anything, on their end before it came to the fire department to start our process and making sure that they're compliant with fire code regulations. Somewhere in the process, um, maybe in January, I, I don't know, there was, um, a, uh, there was a decision that was made in Parks and Rec that they were no longer going to be requiring that paperwork or to, ha to see that they have that paperwork. So we just took Parks and Rec out of it completely and just stayed in our own lane. We were just gonna worry about the fire department requirements. So as it stands right now, I don't know who, if anyone, is checking to see if they have their individual license, individual insurance policies, because that's not falling on the fire department. Mm -hmm. So I know the event applicant or coordinator was getting that information, but I didn't know from a liability standpoint from the city, being that it's on a city property, if the city needed to have that information. I, st I, I stepped back out of that and went back into yeah. the lane. Well, the bottom line here for me is that everybody is doing their job, that the city is maintains as little exposure as possible and that we're doing that. I feel, I'm confident in that. What I have a problem with is the PR standpoint, meaning that I just really want us to concentrate on getting to yes with our vendors and teaching them how to do business in Deltona, and I don't want it to be adversarial, because, you know, I, again, worked with Kelly before, and then having somebody come up to, you know, that, that feels that city's working against them, I just have a, a problem with that, you know, and I would, I, here's the thing, too, that I have a problem with. This is the first time that I've heard about anything, and so I've not been asked to, you know what I'm saying? I've not been asked about it, not heard about it, not had a chance to talk to anybody about it before it got here um, regarding that. So there's that. Fire suppression systems inside of a, um, if you've never seen a, a site blow up with um, with gas or deep fryers mishandled, I highly say that you Google that and you look at that, first of all. I don't have a problem with flat tops out. I mean, propane is propane, but when you're talking about a fryer and big high temps like that, I 
have a problem with them being out without a suppression system. That just comes from seeing what I've seen. Um, so it, this like needs, a, I don't know, a little more <laughs> work maybe if it's not making sense for everyone. I know that we did a lot of work on the, the food truck ordinance, but there's not a lot of understanding and we need to educate and we need to be succinct about what it is we have an expectation of vendors so that they're not frustrated and they don't feel like we don't want them in the city. However, we also want to be known as a safe city. You come in here, please know that you're going to be inspected and that's what you guys do, you know, and I'm hoping that you have enough manpower to do that. Do you feel that you had enough manpower to do what you needed to do? Yes. Okay. And if you if you don't mind, the, the document that I um, respectfully would like to send to you, I also would respectfully like to send to you the information that I do send the event applicants with a lot of information mm -hmm. ahead of time. Um, I don't wait till last minute. Like I said, Kelly's situation was very unique. Um, I do work with the vendors as mm -hmm. best that I can, and there's maybe a handful that we've said, I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to participate due to deep fat frying outside of a tent. Right. Right, so. and I've, listen, I'm about life and safety. This was my, you know, this was my issue with the food truck ordinances. So I wanted to um, I'll personally extend to um, Kellyanne and group to, to sit down and understand how, mis you know what I mean, how communication happens, how to make communication better, because Deltona does want to host, and we want to be the best host. We have some beautiful facilities. But it's stuff like this that, you know, we need to, we need to, um, to work on as far as communication, but thank you for the job you do and in circumstances that you do. It was a difficult situation. Um, and to any vendor that feels like we don't want them, I offer you an apology for that communication because we do want vendors here in Deltona, you know, for business. So, and I think that uh, any, any commissioner is willing to sit down in their office and talk with a vendor about how to get to yes with, with our fire department and with what they need to do. We're here to be helpful. So those are my comments. Thank you. So I have a question for the vendor. Uh, how many years have you done this with the city of Deltona? Us? Yes. This was our second year with the city of Deltona following being asked to relocate from Deland to Deltona. Okay. Uh, Deltona personally approached us about so, moving our festival from Deland to Deltona. So this is the second year you've done this in Deltona, right? Well, the second time, yes. Um, we had a few year break there due to COVID and then the hurricane. So um, our first attempt, I believe, was in 2020. Okay, how was, uh, how was the experience the first time? Um, honest, honestly, this is the second time we've had it in Deltona and this is the second time we've had issues with um, lack of communication and issues with the vendors um, being turned away at last minute due to fire issues. Um, we submit a map ahead of time of where all our vendors are going to be placed. Um, the first time we had all of our vendors moved last minute day of and then this time all of our vendors were told to go to an alternative entrance um, which by the way the reason we chose the entrance we chose was because we had had all of our food vendors send us um, their measurements of their trucks, and we thought that it'd be easier to get them in through the way we were bringing them in. Also, just be less hassle and less conflict. Um, so honestly, it's been two times where it's been very nerve-wracking for us. I know personally I was running on three hours of sleep the day of Bacon and Brew this year. Um, and it's just been really hard to deal with those kind of last-minute additions. Um, so, pardon to interrupt you. La last time you also had some last-minute requests. Last time you did bacon and brew, they, that correct. The had, we had we got minute last request. minute requests, and it was an 11 month notice that we were going to be in your city for this, and we got last minute requests. Okay, mainly so, from the fire department, and we understand safety. We want everybody to be safe. Of course, um, but honestly, not a lot of our food vendors changed in the last three weeks of this festival. So to get a two day notice with a new application, they'd already filled out the original. We got new paperwork for them to fill out two days in advance, and it went to a lot of their spam folders. What so, was the issue the first time? Um, the I'm issue trying to get to the bottom of what seems to be an issue. The, I can tell communication is one of them, but I want to, because you made a couple of comments. So what was the issue the first time you guys did um, that? The issue the first time was vendor location within the Dewey Brewster Sp um, Park on where vendors could and could not be located due to distance from concrete, um, spatial between the two. Um, we ran into some unique um, fire safety rules, I guess if you want to call them, that Delta 
Daytona has that the other municipalities in this county do not. Um, so we just ran into that was a major issue. Um, can you and can you elaborate a little bit on what what differences? Yeah. So I'm distance, not trying to compete with other cities. No, no, no. Deltona so is we we were learning from that because sure. we've worked in other cities. This is our first time in Deltona. Um, we we're having issues with um, being told about distance from concrete to grass and how far off the concrete food vendors could be, as well as how far in between spaces each food vendor needed to be. Um, and then I'm trying to think, I actually had a note going here. Give me a second. Um, and there was also, I guess our first year, we also had a big issue with stage problems as well and getting the stage set up. So this year we just used your guys' city stage, um, which to be quite honest, I don't know how many people are there, does provide a lot less quality. I know you guys are a local town stage, so I don't expect it to be a professional stage, but we did run into issues with that as well our first year and being able to get the stage set up the day of. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Shivers, if you're going to, I have a couple questions for you. Oh, and Kelly's on speakerphone real quick, so she also reminded me cooking on the green and vendors on the green continue to be an issue. Um, like, you guys have a beautiful sports complex. I played sports. I love sports. Um, but the issue of being able to get on the green is consistently an issue that causes a huge delay in being able to get vendors loaded in that then backs up Ms. Shivers and what she's trying to do is getting everybody inspected on the day of. So, thank you. Ms. Shivers, do, you, do we have something when, when vendors are coming in like everything they're supposed to do where it's it doesn't change or fluctuate is there like a set i guess rules or procedures for each vendor uh where they are they're given something after they submitted application yes we give them uh, which it would be one of the documents that i would respectfully ask that i can send to sure. you um they are given it's called a general requirements form and it's probably about a three-page form and it's kind of similar to the checklist that we're working off of now with volusia county and all the municipalities and it it, it lines out everything that they can expect and we have them sign this document that says they understand the requirements again there's code backings that go with it it's nothing that we're pulling out of thin air it's just the problem is enforcement we 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 are we are enforcers unfortunately and I can't speak for other municipalities and what they do or don't do but I do have the code backing to support why we do what we do Okay. In the documents. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chisholm, so I, I, I notice obviously communication, and I think we've talked about this in the past that as a city we need to do a way better job with communicating. I don't know if that's a form of finding some type of technology or what have you. Uh, the removing, I guess, when Marlene uh, retired, that also created some type of a, of a gap. I don't know if that's something that probably uh, Parks and Recs can take back up so it gives, it alleviates some, some of the pressure that they're putting on the fire department. Um, is, that, is that something that you think we can get one of their staff members to probably look at taking back on? Because uh, I, I, get, I get these complaints from other, from other vendors just as Commissioner Avila Vasquez does as well. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll take a look at uh, the staffing associated with events and our facilities, and then we'll also look at uh, what is allowed on which fields. Sure. Because um, I can. There's, there's two points of of interest. Uh, you have a recreation program, and you have professional athletes that use certain fields, and then you have an event that is bringing trucks and equipment out on a field that may not be compatible with the intended use of that field. So we may have to be restrictive in where where these events occur. Sure. Uh, and that's something the, the uh, department's going to have to look at. Uh, beyond that, we're going to have to have probably a vending, a person that, that deals with the events themselves, just a, one designated person in, in the parks department. And uh, that will, that should give us some continuity and how vendors are treated and, and the processes that they would have to go through. And there'll be no passing of fire material or, uh, you know, there's no, it has to be seamless. In other words, your material is his material, his material is your material. So if anybody comes through with an event 
the same material should be given to all the people that are proposing to use our facilities. And we'll need to, you know, clean that up because I, th I don't think that exists right and, now. And that's what I was trying to get to. For example, our planning department has made a lot of changes and they're very positive. They're very thorough. If you start with one person, you finish with the same person. I've seen the complaints on that go down dramatically. So if we have one person that's dealing with events, yes, they'll have to verify something with uh, Ms. Rivers or with uh, uh, Mr. Manning, that's great, but let the vendors deal with one person. That way we have consistently, which is a word that my fellow Commissioner McCool likes to use a lot, and we, we have uh, better communication moving forward. I think that's gonna, that's gonna help a lot moving forward. So, I'm on. Go ahead, Mark, yeah. and then we'll go to Commissioner McCool and then Commissioner Avila Vasquez. So to piggyback off of that, so yes, we have streamlined the, process, streamlined the process quite a bit. So now all the fire department is responsible for is for the food vendors and the vendors to make sure they have all the requirements from the fire department. We just require the event promoter to provide us with all the insurances, the license, all that information. They provide that to us. We don't go chase that from all their vendors. We have the event promoter provide that to us. All the fire department is responsible for now is food trucks, food vendors, tent vendors, whatever. That's their only responsibility. So that streamlined that process. And we started that with Bacon and Brew this year. Perfect, thank you, Mark. Good, uh, Commissioner McCool and then Commissioner. Thank you. I, I want to know, is there a pre-event sit down? Because I've just been in catering for as many years. You have a pre-event at the event site between all the parties. That would be parks, fire, and vendor to make sure that everybody is on the same page. And I mean a physical one, not virtual, not telephone, not swapping two-dimensional paper, but an actual site plan that says this is where this will go. Is there a meeting between all three parties before an event like this? Yes. We have an on-site meeting at the facility prior to the event so with the site map, yes. How were these not discussed during, how are these particular issues not discussed during that time? How is this not caught? How did this perpetuate? With all due respect, um, could we have more of those coordination meetings? Most definitely. Um, the one that occurred with Bacon and Brew, the fire department was not aware of up until one hour before the coordination meeting simply because the Volusia Sheriff's Office asked if I was gonna be in attendance. So could we have more of those? Yes. We did have one um, with that I requested that we do with the Puerto Rican multicultural event. It was a two hour on-site meeting and we learned a lot from them and they learned a lot from us. So if there's anything that we can learn from this and do better on, I, I would appreciate if we could do more of those coordination. That, and then bada boom, bada bing. I think that that takes care of a lot of miscommunication is this you actually have all mom, dad, and the kids in the room when we're having a conversation like this, that that'll clear up a lot of things. Mr. City Manager, that's your call right there as yep. far as policy, but as a commissioner, I would rather you come back and be telling me how fabulous it was instead of this right here. So if we could avoid that in the future by actually having everybody in the room sit down, that is what we call collaboration, and that's a beautiful thing. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Vila Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. So yes, I was. Uh, I had to drop off some stuff for Hector, and he was very happy of the last minute results. Having sat down with Parks and Rex and all of you guys to go over from top to bottom of the event. And I just want to clarify something because I keep hearing comments about cooking under the tents. We're not talking about cooking on the tents. There is no such thing as cooking on the tents. I am talking about opening the air cooking. So the issue is not cooking under the tents. I have not seen any cooking under any tents at all, uh, other than the food trucks. I'm talking about putting some tables out there and cooking out in the air, open air, with all the requirements from the fire department under the tables for, you know, turning off the fires or whatever, the propanes and all that stuff. That's what they're referring to because that's a common thing in all the festivals in other areas in the central floor. So, and I keep hearing cooking under the tent. It uh, has nothing to do with cooking under the tent. We don't allow that from my understanding. Yeah, and again, it, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Again, it's not our it's not our thing. You just take that risk if DBPR, the health department, comes out and sees you cooking outside of a tent. I just wanted to throw that out there that that is, could be an issue. 
So, so that's something that's regulated by the state. Is that what you're saying? It's local the, by this. To be regulated by the state, if you fight, go to Sanford. It's in Sanford. If you go to Ebor, where I just went for an event, it's out there. I mean, they're part of the state. It, so, whether it's whether or not they show up or not, they can show up at random times and not show up at all. So it may just be that they're not showing up. So they're not doing their job. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shivers. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let me just, because uh, we keep confusing this thing. Do you allow people to have an open air fire and cook outside of a, a vehicle? Not deep fat fryers. Okay. Not frying, currently. If it's not frying, yes. Correct. But you guys made the decision. And that's, again, been a decision that I have just brought along with me since I started in 2020. It was already something that was established prior to my arrival here. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and call public comment. Okay. Mayor, there are two public comments, Eric Alexander and then Michael Worker. Eric Alexander, please. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Thank you, Eric Alexander, 1470 Brayton Circle. Most of you know who I am. I am here as in supportive of this. This issue goes far, far beyond events, and that is what I'm, I've, I've lived here since 92. I've been in commercial real estate for 23 years. I'm getting really very frustrated and even have these two Right now, we have a tax office that we can't get open because the fire inspection people are holding it up for a long, and these stories are over, over and over and over and over again. When it gets to the fire inspection team, comments like, because I said so, because that's the way I want it, holding up and saying, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. It's the reputation that I've heard for 20 years. And, and that's, I take that back for the last 10 years, I will say, because I was on the east side before. But there needs to be some oversight here. There needs to be a, a, some kind of checks and balances with these folks. And I'm sorry, Ms. Shiver sounds really nice, and I'm sure she's trying to do her job. She's not even, but they go beyond, far beyond what they even, there's, they're given more power to begin with because of the safety issue, and everybody's glad for that, but it also involves common sense. And there's got to be, there are just things that, that they have cost people thousands of dollars, hundreds of uh, productivity time down the drain. There's a bunch of people that aren't here right now that I know they said they wanted to be, and uh, I apologize to you all. I'm not in the, in the business of trying to destroy somebody or lose their job or anything, but this has got, there just seems to be, we have a team that seems to go try to find everything they can find in the negative instead of how can we make this work? That's more like, how can I hold you up? And I know that's not your intent, but, that's my two minutes. Thank you, Eric. Okay, Michael Worker, and then we have one more, Caroline Shine. Good evening. Thank you uh, for allowing me to present. So I'm kind of here with Eric. Um, I happen to be the contractor that was hired by the Department of Motor Vehicle to provide that facility to the great city of Deltona and to its citizens to implement the quicker response time for your citizens to go obtain driver's license, tags, firearm permits, and everything else that's associated with that facility. So it will be located at, I'm not sure if you know, so it, 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 the, your comments have to pertain to this specific subject. Okay, well. Maybe your experience with, with that, but we can't talk about something that's not on the agenda. Okay, that's fair. Well, okay, well the, the issue is we've applied for a permit and it's been held up for four months and the job should have taken only three months to build. So okay. I would, that's my issue. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Caroline Shine, please. Good evening. Uh, I was uh, told about the meeting. Uh, Mr. Eric told me about the meeting. He asked me to come and just uh, inform you of our plight. We purchased the building 800 Deltona 2012, and we've been going back and forth with the uh, with the city about fire sprinklers. So ma'am, is th this is not pertaining to the bacon and brew fest? No. Um, so what I'm gonna ask the city manager is, if it, it, this seems to be a common theme, that you can please, if, if both of you don't mind, okay. please give your information to a city manager. Okay. Um, I, I get those emails as well. Uh, no offense, Ms. Shivers, you know, it's not, I, I send them directly to the city manager. So respectfully, I'm gonna ask that you please send your information to our city manager. Okay. He's been very diligent about making sure that he follows up and sees what is some of the issues that are okay. happening. Okay, no problem. So I apologize. It's okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming up. I know it, it's... Yeah, just close this public comment. Thank you so much. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and move forward to presentations. Video presentation on the autism symbol by... And, Angelia Hart, Ms. Hart. Thank you for having me. Um, Angela Hart, I'm the creator of the Autism Welcome Decal Symbol. Um, initially, I started this back in 2013. And um, it has been inspired by my adult son, who is going to be 27 this year, who has got uh, severe autism. Um, I initially wanted to try to bring it to light to a, a lot of businesses, big and small, which for years I've been doing it on my own. And I have done it one-on-one uh, -on -one with my son going into these places and testing them out for myself to see how we're being responded to. Um, initially, I started this symbol because um, autism doesn't grow away. The new statistics now from the CDC is 1 in 36. And that's a huge issue for me because when I go into any place, whether it is a little big place, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's sensory friendly. I don't see our families. So personally, I know from experience, they're isolating. And it has to stop. Um, I have been asked to leave with my son on a number of occasions before I decided to create the symbol that needed to be out there. And it was over, for example, one time I went into a place that we were frequent and we were asked to leave because he was simply jumping and flapping, maybe getting a little loud, but uh, it was over a toy he saw and he was excited. We were asked to leave because he was being disruptive. And if I were starting out in this journey of autism, I would never want to go into a place with my kid again. And how are we educating the public about these kids who are going to be adults one day? How are we going to teach them socializing? We're already striving in schools to be treated fairly. We're already striving to fight for our kids for good education, good medical needs dentistry, but what just our daily lives. We have autism events in April. Autism's every day, it's not just in April. And it needs to be recognized. I was watching the news this, oct this April and it was so upsetting and I had so much outrage that we were not even acknowledged, not once. And you go into every month and you're hearing about all these other places and people mentioning organizations and awareness of other things, but not once about autism, and it's one in 36. Do the math. You should be seeing us everywhere. When is the last time you went into one place, just one, and saw an autism family? The only time I see them is when we're in big, big groups. We don't see them on a daily basis, so where are they going? We need to educate them, and through my symbol, I'm hoping to do this. I have um, 
Got this symbol in a lot of places. Before Toys R, Toys R Us closed down, I actually had them in three stores. And I had just reached out to corporation and got consent to have them in all of their stores. That's just Toys R Us. And then, of course, the pandemic threw it out, along with the other places. I have reached out to Georgia even recently, who actually I'm supposed to be going up to my first theme park, Wild Adventures, Thursday. And they're jumping on board to give the symbol a home because they 100% believe in what I do and believe it needs to be out there. When we do these um, test drives, which I offer in a lot of these places who have given it a home, and I have hundreds of homes that I have managed to do all by myself since 2013, no help. And I'm not an organization, I was just a little symbol. Although I have friends that have believed in me so much now that apparently coming the end of this week, I may be becoming an organization because I want it to get out there and apparently I'm not being taken serious enough. So if I have to become an organization over a little symbol that needs to be out there to show welcoming every day, not just in April, giving the awareness and most of all the acceptance and education of us, then I guess I'll have to become a 501c. And that's not what I intended to do here. It's not about money. It never has been. It's about acceptance, educating everybody, and giving us the love that we deserve. Sorry, that's my son's medication alarm, if you don't mind. <laughs> Miss, are you have a video? The video? Please, if you don't mind. So the autism welcome decal symbol is something I think should be here just because the recent um, report from CDC is the new rate for autism is one in 36. Um, when my son was diagnosed, it was one in 66 and he is 26 going on 27. So that'll give you a vast idea of how desperately we need to do something about the education and acceptance, not just the awareness of autism. Um, my symbol is created just for that. Um, we do have ribbons out there for awareness and that's fabulous. However, acceptance is what our families crave more than anything because it is so desperately hard to walk into places such as this, especially big places like this that we have to enter. And it's not easy to find someone to watch our little or big guys that have autism. So this kind of gives them that um, comfort and that welcoming sign that they get it, they're, they're gonna be understanding and accepting you as you are, will not be asking you to leave and give you the comfort you need that you can courageously go into places like this with or without your loved one. Okay, so I have two. Um, Florida's obviously pretty um, hot and sunny. So when you come to the clear doors, I do have ones that go on the inside. Um, which with this being a clear door, it would go on the inside. However, if we have the darker tent, just to give you a more visual of what it would look like, it would go something like that. Um, typically, I am not the one that hangs it. I have someone who is in charge of these places to hang it because I don't want anybody to think that I just placed it there. I want them to know that it was placed here intentionally for a reason. So, you know, in spite of the fact there's other signs here, maybe there's a little, oh, look there, there's a little spot just waiting for my symbol. So that would be a great spot. It's, it's hard to go into these places. Um, and, and to go into a place like this knowing that we can bring our guys and girls and not have to worry about any issues, that's what we need. Um, you don't see any of us into these places. And I think anybody who says that and listens to this phrase would believe that because with one in 36, think about the number. You should be seeing a family like mine every day and in every place you enter and you don't. And it is simply because they're isolating. It's easier, it's not evasive. You don't have to worry about somebody judging you or being critical of you or just not being so nice. And that needs to change. A lot of people wanna be educated about autism. Well, this is a start. You put this symbol in there, you're going to encourage us to come in and you're gonna learn by the best teachers out there and that's the families themselves.
They can go to www.autismwelcomedwithad.com. Um, I also have them available on Facebook. I'm on every social media there is. So it's really not hard to get, and they can always message me if they still can't find it, which they shouldn't have a problem doing so. And they're very affordable. Um, I'm not an organization, I am a symbol. And every symbol that I have for sale is going for strictly the cost that I take to make them. So I'm not out to make a profit off of what I do. I am simply out to make smiles. And my slogan, I think, says it all. Opening doors, opening hearts, and creating smiles every day and everywhere. Thank so you. The autism welcome decal symbol is something I think should be here just because the re Sorry. Is there any questions or comments from the commissioners? No. No questions? No. Thank no. you, Ms. Hart. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This time we're gonna move forward to Deltona Water and Public Works Department's report. <laughs> it the wrong way. You getting nervous on us, Glenn? No, sir. <laughs> I'm just getting old. Okay, um, this is a brief update of uh, Public Works in Deltona Water. Um, I want to start out with just a few things, um, give you a little bit of an update. Um, road, roadway resurfacing, um, the contract was awarded to PNS Paving in the amount of $2 million to resume the milling and resurfacing program. Uh, we anticipate the work to commence in the next few weeks. There was a slight delay between the award and the contract, but that's been addressed, so we should be moving forward here pretty shortly. Um, the Northwest Drainage Project is underway. It's within about two weeks of being completed. That consisted of putting some under drain in and a pump station to pump the stormwater out of that area. Um, it included Covington Drive, portions of Covington Drive, uh, Pigeon Cove Street, Monarch Avenue, Hartley Street, Mandenville Street, and Slater Drive East. Um, the next thing I want to talk about real quick is the uh, new meter installs, the change outs. The contract was awarded to Vanguard Utility Services um, to install initial amount of 10,000 meters to begin with. Um, initiation of the work when we start will be at uh, the Lakeshore Edgewater Condominium community, which has around 700 meters to be changed out there. Deltona Water Crews have been and continue to install um, these new meters at uh, the new subdivisions. We're going ahead and putting them in now until so when the contractor gets here, he can concentrate on what's already in place. Um, I talked to the contractor today myself, personally called them to see what was going on. We're trying to get a med, uh, meeting scheduled this week to go over the process and what's gonna be needed. They have a lot of information they have to, can y'all hear me okay? Um, they have a lot of information that they need to get from us to begin with, with customer accounts and different, different uh, things like that, our meter routes and the priority that we want to uh, install these meters. Uh, let's see. We have been working with Tyler Technologies. You know, I came to y'all a few months ago um, getting uh, approval to have them work with us so that we can get the data um, transferred into the Munis, our billing system. Uh, we've been doing, uh, we have a gentleman, uh, a um, business specialist, Chris Triplett, has been working on getting the test environment with that. He's been testing as we are putting, physically putting meter, meters in ourselves. he's in testing that environment with our billing system. So that's going very well. If the meter installs go like I'm thinking they're going to now with the progress we've made with the billing system um, with Munis, 
um, I think we'll be able to move forward, get the first 10,000 in fairly re uh, quick and be able to start on a second uh, 10,000. We wrote the contract where we can extend it depending on the their performance with the contract. If they're doing a good job and they can get them done in a in a expedited manner, then we'll move forward with another batch of the meters getting them installed. Um, another project we we have going coming to the commission, or actually, um, yes, Lake Helen Osteen sanitary sewer replacement. Uh, we, we have a contract with Hazen Construction which will be scheduled to be presented to the City Commission on June the 19th for approval and that's to replace approximately 265 linear foot of uh, 8 inch gravity main and rehab a couple of manholes in the process. Um, the Teresa Basin Flood Control Study RFQ is due back to us this Thursday. Once that's back, the city manager will appoint a committee to rank the, the studies to go through and be able to uh, rank the firms. Once we have a recommendation, which should just be pretty shortly, I would say within the next month, we'll be to the commission for approval uh, for that recommendation and we'll move forward with that Teresa Basin study which is gonna be a good thing to identify areas of flooding, you know, and things, projects that we can do to uh, mitigate that flooding. Um, plan 11, our Cortland water plant on 551 Cortland, um, where we are, have went out to bid um, to outfit those two wells, which would include piping, panels, pumps, and then simply running the pipe to the plant and tying it all in that we got that bid in um, last week. We will be coming to the commission projected to be coming to y'all for approval of the award to bid uh, July the 3rd, if we're having the commission meeting that night. Um, 4B, I know there's a lot of questions about 4B, which is the Lakeshore project. Um, we, we, uh, we're working on a letter to be provided to all the partners such as St. John's, um, DEP, um, West Volusia Water Supply Group, et cetera, on the plan to end the construction of the project. Um, the project was unconstructable due to unforeseen site and construction issues. As you well know, we've talked a few times about the boils that, that sprung up, no pun intended. Um, so we will be coming forward with that before much longer and get that taken care of. Then all the uh, material will be moved and stored elsewhere or resent back to the vendors to see if we can restock some, some of the stuff that the city has purchased. Um, Elcam bypass pump station, a permanent pump. We came before you a few weeks ago and got approval to purchase the pump. Um, there was about a 12 to 16 week lead time on that pump. So once we get that in, we'll be coming back to you for installation for a contractor to install that pump. So that will make that uh, lift station more reliable. If there are any issues, this pump will automatically come on if the level comes up and be able to keep it pumped down. Uh, water main replacement, I'm almost done, sorry. Water main replacements, uh, we're working with our consultant to get group two, three, and four water main replacements out to bid. Um, we should be going out really soon. Our new city engineer, Tom Wynn, has been working with a consultant and getting that taken care of and so that we can get the construction underway. We did complete group one water mains. That was a big project. That was quite a few areas that, that had replacements. Um, Next thing is the Eastern Wastewater Treatment Plan expansion. It's underway now. The contractor's been receiving materials and supplies for that work to begin. They did begin today on draining some of the tanks and they're gonna be replacing, first of all, they're gonna be replacing and adding new diffusers to the plant as part of this project. Um, the membrane uh, plates have already been delivered on site, a lot of the material. Where we're having a problem is supply chain issues. I think, I think all contractors know that. Everybody has had the same type of issue. Ours is mainly electrical. Uh, the panels that are required to run these pieces of equipment, um, they have things, VFDs or variable frequency drives, they're very hard to come by um, because they are, made specifically for the piece of equipment that we're gonna be using, their size for that. So we're, as soon as uh, those things get in, we'll be able to complete this project. But we have, it is underway now. They did start, they did start draining tanks to do a portion of it today. 
Um, and last thing is the Fisher Wastewater Plant Analysis. We had the kickoff meeting with the consultant and we are, the city is providing information to the consultants for this endeavor. And then the, along with Fisher, the plant process conversion to the MLE, uh, that process is underway and the contractor is waiting on some electrical components as well for pumps and panels and stuff and drives. So that's pretty much a brief synopsis of what we have going on. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McCool, then Commissioner Avila Vasquez, then Commissioner Jodley. I want to, um, assurances, or I want to be informed that with the Lakeshore project, right, with the disassembly that we have an ongoing mitigation plan with that, right? Yes. Yes, yes we do. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we're in talks about what the future is going to, you know, be for that. Yes, yes. we've been, uh, the city manager and our staff have been in talks of what we're doing. We've also spoken with St. John's and DEP, a representative for DEP, about funding and that type of thing. And Mr. Chisholm has us working on a plan for restoration for that site and some, some uh, other things that may be able to go in that place. Okay, because I just want to make sure that, you know, I mean, this has been a plague to us. Um, it should have been stopped the first problem they had and stuff, whatever, that's hindsight, it's 2020. But um, I just want to make sure that the public has assurances because it's been horrible for the public that live down there too. I'm sure our, our esteemed commissioner for that district hears it all the time and she has to answer questions about it. So I just want to make sure that we're already in talks about what are we doing, how soon can we get it back into the public's hands, um, and also, as painful as it is, a final tally of what the cost was to the taxpayers for this and what we have done as far as placing the onus on the, you know, I need to understand what went, you know what I'm saying? Right. We, we talked about that, but the public, uh, if the public asks, the public needs an accounting of that also. So I just want to make sure that that is the expectation moving forward. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Vila Vasquez and then Commissioner Joe Lee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Glenn, with the bill billing system, what is the status of paperless billing? We had an issue with the original contractor, which was CORE. Um, we're looking at Tyler Technologies now because we're having issues with CORE with the uh, Tyler or the cashiering portion of it. So we're working diligently. We're, we're looking at possibly switching to uh, the, it's the company that works on our, our billing system that we currently have. And we're looking at switching to them to make this thing go faster because we have not, we're not satisfied with where we are uh, with CORE at this mm -hmm. point. And that also, uh, you guys are also going to be looking at setting up a payment automation, auto, auto payment, like? Yes. Because, you know, we've had a lot of uh, snowbirds coming back. Right. And District 3 being one of the biggest areas you know, of people who are coming back to Florida for this season. These questions, every time they see me in public, I'm like, oh Lord, here comes the paperless billing and the auto payment uh, questions, which is legit because they're not here uh, to receive all this information, um, even though they get it to a PO box. So this is something you guys are working on? And yes, ma'am, and when we get further along, I'll give you another update on Thank you. where we, we are. They will really appreciate it. I was gonna t talk about, uh, about the 4B uh, Lakeside Project. Uh, Commissioner McCool already mentioned some of my questions, but I have one more. Um, I went to an event at the uh, Lakeshore Drive condos and I, on my way out I drove by and that lakeside looks really horrible. Um, it has like uh, some retainers, uh, iron, and that water just stands there. Yes, that's part of the restoration effort. We're gonna be taking those sheet, those are sheet piles that they drive down in into the uh Lime Rock, that, those will be removed and the seawall will have to be built. That's all part of this restoration project, um, you know, to close this project out. 
okay? Because one of the questions they're asking me is, can they just take those things off and let the water circulate and clean up because it really looks horrible. Yes, once we get once we get the project uh, identified and nailed down for the removal of all that, yes, because they have to remove those, they have to move forward and put some back down where the seawall is and rebuild the seawall in there. That's part of rebuilding that and the boat, getting the boat ramp back in service. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, That's it, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Jody Lee. Thank you, Claire, for coming up with all this. And I just want to thank all the workers for doing everything and getting all this stuff done. You know, we're, I, I just hope you prior, prioritize some of these issues. I mean, hurricane season is here. It's it's here. So I hope we look through this list and see what needs to be done faster or sooner than other projects. And I hope the Lake Helen Olsen Elkham area is in there somewhere with that flooding right there because that turns into a lake by itself right there in that one section. Um, when all this different stuff are going on, I I won't say the company name, but there's an engineering company. It seems like every time they're involved with something in this city, it costs us money. And I'm sure you know what company I'm talking about, if anybody, everybody knows. And I, I hope some of these projects don't have their name on it every single time, because we've just paid out a bunch of money to these people and made mistakes, and we still seem to pay them. I just hope we can stop doing that, because it seems like we're just throwing money out the window. But other than that, thanks for all the stuff you guys are getting done, all the stormwater projects, the road work that's getting done, streets are getting resurfaced. We got more projects going on in this city than people even tend to realize. But of course, if you look at uh, Facebook, we're not doing nothing in the city. It's worse now than it's ever been in the history of Deltona, but evidently people don't look. So I just wanna, I appreciate all the work you guys been doing. Ms. Phyllis, all the work your, your people been doing, all the city employees, I'm happy with progress we're making. And we are, just to expound a little bit on the hurricane preparedness, we are in hurricane preparedness mode. We have already started that. Um, there's been some ditches, uh, primary ditch canals that have been mowed. Uh, some stuff is being uh, done like that. We're checking all the pumps. We're checking everything to make sure we're ready to go with the, with the hurricane season. So Glenn, uh, I, I actually have a couple questions before I go back to Commissioner McCool. And in, in keeping with transparency with all of our residents, right, how prepared do you think we are, because we're in hurricane season, right? We just went through some dev devastating hurricane. Um, are our retention ponds dredged? I mean, how, how prepared, in your professional opinion, are we ready if, God forbid, we get another Ian? I think we're prepared as we can be, and I preface that by we are regulated by St. John's with certain things that we cannot do, um, but we are doing everything in our power. Um, if, you, if you've noticed, the lake levels have been down. We haven't been draining them, by the way. We, I wanna make that clear. Um, we have, we're in a drought right now, so the lakes are dropping you know, a lot on their own. Um, but we're, we're making other preparations with pumps and different things. We have strategies of you know where we're gonna put everything we learned from this last one. But as you all well know, a uh, hurricane can come in, rain can fall on the, on the east side of Deltona and the next storm it could be in the middle of Deltona so it can be just about anywhere. So uh, we have been, uh, our stormwater manager, Mr. Walker, has been working with our vendors that we used last year uh, on the pump rentals, um, getting all that squared away. So we've got priority with all that if we need it. Um, and we've been talking to the county, we've been talking to different people throughout the state that I'm, I'm associated with. Um, so if we need some help, we will be able to get it. And we're out there diligent. And Mayor, I don't wanna see any houses flood at all. I don't wanna see anything. I mean, we're, Public Works is very compassionate about what we do and what, you know, the flooding. It really broke our heart. In all honesty, it was pretty sad and, and we hated it. Um, but we're gonna do everything in our power to keep it, keep what we can from happening. When we had the unprecedented rain, the unprecedented storm, uh, we're not the only place. If you look at Fort Myers, you look at you know a lot of other places on the coast, but not only the coast, inlands too, inland areas also. So we're gonna do everything we can, I assure you that. I promise you that, standing here looking in your eyes, that I'm gonna do that. And, and I know you guys will, I, I, I can say that uh, I'm very proud of the staff that we have. I'm glad that we're in capable managing hands and with the uh, uh, incoming deputy city manager, I, I'm more than confident now. Uh, 
But you know, we I, I ask this question because I know our residents want to know, and, and right. you know, to help build that communication. I know for a lot of things like lowering the the, the levels of the of the lakes, that was an issue, and for the most part, our hands were tied. Right. So um, I understand that uh, Lakeshore. How long uh, estimate? And I get that we can't give an exact time, but. Um, how long do you think it's going to take for that place to be usable for our residents again, specifically the ones that live in that area? I'm going to defer to the city manager unless he wants me to answer because we've been in meetings and he has an expectation <laughs> and, and I don't want to give you something and then, you know, I'll be wrong. I, I know what I think and I know what he thinks. We've talked. Sure. Mr. Chisholm. We'll get down there tomorrow and open it up. So. <laughs> I wish I could do that, but uh, the, the reality is we've got some things that we're working on, particularly the community center. It should be pretty close, um, and we look forward to try to getting that open in probably the next 30 days. Okay. Uh, the, um, the property around it has to be maintained a little better than it is right now, but uh, uh, they've moved along and trying to get uh, the building in shape, and we've got that accomplished. I think we've got the AC in. So we're real close to being able to use that. The, uh, the rest of that project, uh, 4B, um, we're all working on trying to solve the issue associated with the project, its original intent, and coming back with a, a plan of action that will further that intent, uh, uh, probably in a different way than what it was conceived initially. Uh, but um, largely uh, significant funding is available for for that project and it's still still in our um, in our plan but we'll have to come back with the time and and really the expectation I don't have that today perfect but at least the building side of it we at least know at least within th 45 to 30 days give or take correct yes sir Perfect, thank you, Mr. Chisholm. Uh, for the billing, on the billing uh, stuff that we're going through, are we gonna finally make the change where every other statement company out there, whether it's credit cards, other mortgages, whatever it is, where we actually send the person's first name and last name, or are we still gonna leave it where it's last name, first name? <laughs> Legitimately, I know it sounds silly, and of course we have so many more important things to talk about, but I do get residents that have issues I'm probably one of them. So my first name sounds like a last name, and sometimes my my bill will get forwarded to somebody else because they happen to have a last name of Santiago that lives there, and the mail, the USPS, reads it first name last name regardless. We will. I will address that with the with the contractor. Perfect. Thank you. And then, as far as the the wall for the lakeshore. Uh, is there any way, and I don't know if that's a Mr. Chisholm question, but uh, we can talk to the county about getting funds for that because there's a lot of talk about seawalls for the beaches, but again, all the cities on the west side seem to get forgotten over and over, and uh, unless we start getting some attention from our fellow uh, county commissioners, uh, which I, I applaud David, he does a great job in communicating at least once a week, but I wanna see funding from the county because if we're not gonna see funding, then where's the relationship? You know, I see a lot of us giving and, and, and not giving back. So can we get money for that? The rebuilding of that, what is it, lake wall, I guess you can the call it? Wall. A, is it's it a sea wall, wall still? Yeah. Well, we, can I jump in just a yeah. second, sir? Um, we had to take part of that seawall out for this project. We had to cut part of it out for the structure to sit in there. So we're gonna definitely have to restore all that. That was in the plan to restore, you know, anyway, with this with this project. Whether funds be available, um, we can work with our grants person, uh, Kimberly. Um, you know, Mr. Chisholm or Mr. Carl may have some other thoughts, but we can, we can kind of, we can definitely try to um, take something forward, yes, sir. Okay, so we'll reach out to the county to just try to get some type of funding. That, yes. that was my question. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. My last question, I promise. Mr. Chisholm, moving forward, can we, and, and this is just for the public knowledge, right? Are we gonna be able to be in a place where we can dictate our own lake levels? So God forbid another hurricane comes, 
the weathermen's are really good at giving predictions on how many inches of rain we're gonna get. We can go by and say, you know what, in two days we're gonna lower the lakes by four inches because we're gonna get eight, eight inches of rain. Are we gonna have that freedom or is St. John's still gonna be restricting us? I really can't tell you the answer to that. The, the, uh, that is our objective, is to have control of the lakes, uh, elevations, uh, and have a system where we can determine wh what the elevations are throughout the Teresa Basin and the adjoining lakes, and have a system that uh, allows us to remotely control the actions that were necessary to maintain a level throughout uh, the system of lakes. So, that's saying a lot, of, a lot about nothing because it has to be studied. We have to study the, the, um, you know, the flows that uh, leave the city system that goes anywhere else, and flows that will be coming in, and we have to quantify all those things. And someone a lot smarter than I am is going to be able to put that together. But that's that is our goal. Very, so, very similar to what you see. If you go to south of here, uh, the Kissimmee River Basin, which runs from uh, Orlando all the way to Lake Okeechobee, um, that has a series of locks and, and control structures. And I think you, the, what we would have here is not as magnificent as what they have, but certainly it would operate very similar to that if we were able to get that done. Okay, the reason I bring that up is so publicly the, the residents can know that there was an offer from uh, U.S. Senator Marco Rubio that if we attach a study to it, he would write us a letter from his office of recommendation to either remove the weir or allow the city of Daltona to be the one that governs over it and no one dictate to us when we can or cannot lower our, our uh, lake beds or lake uh, water levels. So. All right, Commissioner McCool. <clears throat> Thank you, really quickly here. Um, with, with the matter of hurricane preparedness and what we have done, okay, I think that it is paramount that we get this information out to the residents in a forward-facing type of way, what the project lists are, because people are empowered by knowledge here, and they wanna know, right, if we, it, and listen, I know you guys don't do anything else, Phyllis and Glenn, so I'm just, I'm just kidding. If is there something, some way that we can prepare the public, right, with these project lists that they can access on the web page or whatever, because there are people that really want to understand and know projects that are happening around the city and within their neighborhood. And it and it, if they can go and look by district what's being done, and they know that they have that knowledge and we keep that updated as a living document, I think that we have less um, conflict and, and people feeling more empowered to know what's going on, especially in a situation like hurricane preparedness. I went to the county's um, comp plan thing the other night and there was the uh, hurricane preparedness uh, from the county was there and I have the card and I asked that we do that post haste that we get in touch with them at the county and send a person in here so that if we have residents that are in an area that there are concerns, anybody can come in and arm themselves with hurricane preparedness stuff. We need to do that. And I know that we know what we're doing, but it's a different matter to for the public to know what we're doing. So we can't operate, I, I don't want us to operate in a bubble. I want us to have that information out there in a forward facing way to the public. Things like where can they get sand bags, who do they call, you know, what do we do and not do. So I, I just want us to make sure that that happens at, at the pleasure of the city manager, but right away, um, because it's been mentioned a lot, and I don't care, we live and die by social media, it, it's the truth, that's how some people communicate, and we have people, we have a water bill, if we can mail out a flyer into the water bill with some tips, with some information on how to get in the website, on who to call, on where to go, if we can prepare that please and get it out in the water bill even if people don't pay the water bill people get their water bill and and let's enclose some information about that that would be fantastic and as I finish up mr. mayor I noticed that we have a 
young man, a Boy Scout in the back, and I would like to talk with you before you leave because you're probably getting some community service points right now or something. And I think it's imperative that you come up and you meet your city staff, not just sit there in the back, but you understand that we work for you. And before the end of the meeting or at the end of the close of the meeting, I want you to meet everybody here and know what they do so that when you have a problem, you feel empowered to take care of it. Okay, so I'm making that request. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner McCool. We're gonna to go to Commissioner Real Vasquez and then we'll go to City Manager. Thank you very quickly, um, Commissioner McCool. I think, you know, we had a hurricane awareness event here. Unfortunately, we have very poor attendance. Um, but I think there's a lot of information out in the lobby for those who, you know, wanna come and get them. I understand, you know, to, um, mail it out, but just an FYI, if anybody wants to stop in and pick them up, I'm pretty sure they were, uh, and, and there was really good, uh, you know, handouts that were prepared by the fire department, the uh, sheriff's department, um, our, even our own staff was here giving good information. So if anybody's interested, I'm pretty sure there's some out there, and if not, we can probably uh, get some from the back and restock the area there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vila Vasquez. Uh, Mr. Chisholm, uh, City Manager comments. Yes, Glenn, sir. Thank you so much. Just a few things. Uh, you know, um, being transparent, I don't want to lead people to think that we're going to, you know, uh, make swift changes all of a sudden because it takes, it's a process. You know, we had hurricanes, we had to recover from the hurricanes, then we had to go find money, find a way to fund them, and uh, we're going to be in the process of designing improvements, which we're doing right now, in the process of designing uh, the plan that's going to go forward, and then once that plan is done, we'll have to get permits for the plan, and once you get the permits, then we'll have to begin the plan of construction, which we're talking, we're talking about in segments of months and years as we go forward. So uh, it's, it's a long process, but the end result will be rewarding to everybody, but um, we have to get started and that's what we're doing. Um, so I didn't wanna lead everybody to think, well, next week there's gonna be something dramatic out there. It's, it's just really not possible. Now there are things we are gonna do that are dramatic. We are gonna do the routine things that get us ready for the hurricanes. Uh, we are also gonna do things that are, uh, that we can do with other, that will, are not related to hurricanes, but there are other improvements to our system, drainage, roads, things like that, that we have funding for. And uh, as soon as we find out what is approved finally by the state, um, then we'll be moving fast on those kinds of projects where we have ready available funding from the state as well as our own funds. So I can tell you there will be things happening. It won't be necessarily everything we want, but it'll be uh, designed to happen in a way that, um, that really shows progress in the city. Um, the one thing that it's really difficult, and I, the hardest job um, in this city is probably two positions, an inspector, and a code enforcement officer. They both have responsibilities that, uh, that rely on codes that are developed by humans uh, that don't always take in consideration every aspect of what they find in the field. And in both cases, they have to use judgment. And judgment's not, um, it's not written down. You know, there's not anything here that says, this is the right judgment and the right call with the situation and that uh, we have to empower people to think and empower people to use judgment. Uh, and um, some of the things that, that I want to show is I want, to, we had a long discussion today about open fires and, and um, cooking food in a kettle. I've seen them blow up. I don't know if you have, but I have. And some of that's because somebody didn't know what they were doing. But it, they, they are dangerous. It's not just something that uh, we're gonna keep somebody from doing something because he knows what he's doing. Well, I don't know that's ever, that's always the case when you're talking about flammable products and real heat and, and uh, you got grease. It's all very flammable once it gets caught. And then the horrific 
uh, outcome of that is beyond tragic. So uh, we're not trying to be, and the, the, I, I credit kudos to the fire inspectors. They're trying to do their job the best they can. They do have our interest at heart, but I do think we're gonna have to have a demonstration of what happens when it goes wrong. Just so people understand, these are not just arbitrary things. There's a reason why the fire department is empowered to do some of these things. And they, um, they get criticized and, uh, and you know, communications uh, probably could have been better periodically for that one, one event. Um, it didn't happen overnight. It happened over a long sequence of months. And uh, some of that probably could have been overcome. But in any event, we're gonna do a better job on our end, but I want you to know that the staff we got is doing an outstanding job. And it's really the job that nobody wants to tell you no. We all wanna say yes, but sometimes for the health and safety of the, of the people that we serve, you have to say no. So I'll leave that with you. I thank you for being patient going through this. Uh, hasn't been the most interesting day, but it certainly has been rewarding in that the, we're having discussions about things that we all understand are important, and that's important for this city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Mayor, there was one public comment on Deltona Water. I apologize, Ms. Terry Ellis. Please come up. Sorry, that's why I got a big mouth. No problem. You know, I'm not offended. Um, just one item, so the new water meters. So I've had mine, um, I had a problem at my house, my meter wasn't working. I was one of the first houses that had the new meters. And um, I wanna talk about, I wanna ask about the level of service as far as personnel at the water department. Because twice when I've called in, I've been on hold for 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And then I've talked to someone and they said that they were the only person in the office. And so um, my understanding is that we have to have a network in place so that all of these wonderful AMI um, processes and procedures, we can take advantage of that. So during all the reporting for Deltona Water, I didn't hear anything about when we have the meters in place, when will this network be online, and when will all of these wonderful AMI features go out to customers? Because I had a problem going on. I had a sprinkler leak recently. I called in, and I had to argue with the person. I had to tell them, listen, I have an AMI meter. I should be able to get this data. First of all, my understanding is that eventually Deltona Water will be able to proactively notify customers but my understanding is that we don't have the system in place right now. So, but when I call in and I have a meter, I should be able to get that data. And I had to argue with this person. So what's going on with the personnel? What's going on with the answer times? Because in this day and age, it's ridiculous that you have to sit on the phone for 40 minutes. Overflow processing is dirt cheap. So I just wanted to bring that up about when the new system is gonna be online so that customers experience all the wonderful benefits from the new meters. Thanks. Thank you so much, the meeting's adjourned.